that hymn, All Hail King Jesus. And I love the line in there, we join with all of heaven singing this. I don't know if you ever think about that when you come to worship. You're, we're joining our voices with the hosts of heaven who are always praising him and Christians all around the globe to hail his name, to remind ourselves as we proclaim that he is Lord, that there's only one king. There are a lot of voices in our culture clamoring for loyalty and allegiance, saying that they're in charge, and there's only one, King Jesus, and it's good to come and praise his name together. Let's stand together as we read the text from James chapter 3. James 3, verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a very small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does the spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. O oh Lord, may your word penetrate our minds and hearts. May the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth be blessing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. You may be seated. All right, I'm going to begin with a question. We're in a series, as you know, in James uh, called Faith Works. James's concern is how does our faith work, work itself out into every area of our lives? And it's no surprise or secret what the topic is this morning. How does our faith impact our speech, the words that we say? How should it impact them? So here's the question. What were the last words you spoke before you fell asleep last night? The last words that came out of your mouth. Can you remember them? Anybody remember? Maybe you can. My guess is for most of you, it's probably hard. I'm not sure exactly what the last words were. I remember this conversation. Maybe I was, I was frustrated by something I saw on TV or whatever. I don't know. How, okay, maybe it get easier. What were the last words that you spoke out loud before you walked in those doors, before you started singing? You remember those? My point is, for most of us, there's a lot of words coming out all the time. And we rarely remember them or think deeply about them or why we're saying or what we're saying at all. How many words does an average person speak in a day, in a week, a month, a year? On average, studies vary, but on average, women speak roughly 18 to 20,000 words a day. Men, less. <laughs> I mean, not as much less as you might think, uh, we joke about that, but 14 to 16,000 words in a day. It's a lot of words being poured out by a lot of people all day, every day. The average person in one year speaks enough words out loud to fill 100 books of 200 pages each. What's in those books? And my, maybe the, the bigger question is, what are all those words producing? What's the meaning of it all? A lot of talk going on. Given all the words that come out of our mouths, it shouldn't be shocking to us that God's word has something to say about our words and how we use them. As I said, James's point here is to talk to us about how our faith in Christ informs works in every aspect of our lives. Today our speech is, he calls it our tongue. In verse one, you might remember, he says, not many should presume to be teachers because you know those of us who teach will be judged more strictly. I almost wanted to skip right over that verse as somebody who teaches and jump to the next one. It makes me tremble a little bit. Well, what does that have to do with the topic? Quite a lot, actually. Here's his point. In the early church, in the very early days of the church, 
teachers were critical to the health of the church and the growth of the spiritual growth of the followers of Jesus. The, the literacy rate was somewhere between 10 and 15 percent in the average population in the Greco-Roman world. Most people could not read, and those who could read had very limited, if any, access at all to books or parchments or scrolls. Those were rare. How many Bibles are in your home? Not, besides the ones on your phone or your computer screen. It's, it's tons. We have so much access, we take it for granted. But in the early days, when James is writing this letter, the average person could not read at all. If they could read, they had no access to the Word of God, which was still being written and circulated. They were dependent on faithful teachers who had memorized, studied, and were passing on and instructing people in the faith tradition. By tradition, we don't mean human tradition. We mean the traditions of Jesus, his birth, life, teachings, death, and resurrection, and how all of who he is informed all that came before him in the Old Testament and would come after him. That's what they're teaching. That's what the church is supposed to still be teaching. And God's point is teaching serious business. Today, what does it take to be a teacher? iPhone and a YouTube channel, right? Just post whatever you want out there. Oh, you get likes and clicks and follows and... And I, and, I, I know, and I thank God that we have so much access to good teaching across the globe. That's wonderful. But also it should give us pause. It gives me pause because as somebody called to teach God's word for a living, I should, and for, and for my life, I should pause and say, Lord, there's an accountability here that I need to take seriously. And for you, you should also give pause and think, who do you allow to be teachers in your life and why? Do you know them? Can you trust them? Are they in a community where they're vetted or is it just some face on a screen? Okay, we gotta move on or we're never gonna get through this sermon. So that's what he's talking to us about there. The whole section in James 3 is really a continuation of themes he's mentioned earlier. James tees up a lot of subjects that he goes deeper in throughout the letter and that's what's happening here about our words. Remember verse, chapter 2, verse 12. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. Speak. And act, your speech and your conduct. And then in verse 19 of chapter 1, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. How much is our culture the exact opposite of that? We talked about this a few weeks ago. We're so quick to give our opinions, so quick to have something to say, to presume we know enough, we're informed enough to have an opinion on every issue. I feel that pressure as a lead pastor. People, what should we say? Pastor Jeff, what should, what should we say about, what are you going to say about the war in Israel, the war in Ukraine, or whatever issue in our culture? And if you're silent today on any issue, it's, it, the assumption is what? You're ignorant, you don't care, or you're on the wrong side of history. When actually the scripture says to be silent is the better part of wisdom most of the time, to hold your tongue. Sometimes it's better to say, I don't know what to think, and Lord, I'm going to be quick to pray and slow to give my opinion. This is what the Bible talks about, and James is saying wisdom from above is needed when it comes to what we say. So it's wise to be careful with our words because words are powerful. This is the first point, the power of the tongue that James is making for us here. The power of the tongue is undeniable. There's tremendous power in our words. Interpersonally, how many of you can still carry around in your heart words of blessing and encouragement someone spoke to you years ago? Anybody? How many of you still carry around words of harm or discouragement in your hearts? Yeah. Words have power. They also have power on a grander scale in our society, in civilization. Wars have been fought over words spoken and words misunderstood. In 1945, at the escalation of the war in the Pacific, the U.S. issued an ultimatum to the Empire of Japan demanding unconditional surrender or suffer devastating consequences. And the, at the time, the Prime Minister of Japan, Kentaro Suzuki, responded with a single Japanese word, mokusatsu, which comes from the root word in Japanese for silence. He intended this, in the, in the vernacular of the Japanese of the day, to mean no comment, make no comment, make no reply. But American and British media interpreted that as not worthy of comment. Ignore. And that got taken and run with, and the, and the response that the, the world heard was, the Prime Minister of Japan is ignoring our warning. Ten days later, the atomic bomb fell on Hiroshima. 
Not because of that word, but certainly not it was related to it. James makes his point, how great a fire is set ablaze by a tongue, such a small thing. Look at verses three through five again. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so let large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder. Wherever the will of the pilot directs, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. This idea of bits in the mouths of horses. You know what the bit is? That little piece that goes inside the horse's mouth. My uncle Jerry lived in Montana, worked on a ranch, and I would spend some summers working for him when I was a little kid, learned to ride a horse there. Anybody ever learned to ride a horse? A real, like, I don't mean like when they, when they put you on the things that like goes around, or lead, those broken down horses that are just, I mean, a, a horse in Montana. The, did you know this, by the way? The, the horse uh, will swell its belly. I'm trying to get the cinch on. And then once you get the cinch tight, you think it's tight, they kind of relax, and you, the saddle slides off, and so do you. That happened to me biting my fingers trying to get the bit in the mouth right but the bit that little thing can control this massive powerful animal this is James's metaphor here's an image of Natalie Coffin Natalie is uh, in her uh, I think she's 15 or 16 in this picture riding her horse MTM Winsome a 16 hand 1200 pound German Holsteiner controlled by this little teenage girl by the way I just found out Natalie got a scholarship to Texas A&M for equestrianness, whatever it is. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. So congratulations, Natalie. You see the next picture here, close up of the bit. What makes this massive thousand pound plus animal go where this little teenage girl wants? Small thing. Now James is not saying that your tongue directs all of your life, but he's, this point is a metaphor that this relatively small thing, your physical tongue, stick your tongue out for a minute. Tongue looks nothing. you. Or words, simple word, can have huge impact. That's his point. Your words are moving you, impacting you and others, setting a kind of direction. Proverbs, we looked at this a few months ago in our series on wisdom from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. I don't know if you caught this or not. But this idea of death and life being in the power of the tongue. Death and life, power of the tongue. And you will eat its fruits. Remember the phrase, eat your words? This is what he's talking about. The, the author of, of Proverbs, Solomon, is telling us, you will eat the fruit of your words, ultimately. Think about that for just a minute. If that's true, what kind of fruit do you want to eat? Do you want to be eating the bitter fruit of your own words? Words of pride, of envy, of harshness, criticism, cruelty, deceit? Or do you want to eat the fruit of kindness, encouragement, grace, love, truth spoken, seasoned with love? You're going to eat the fruit of your words, we're told. All of us will. And death and life are in the power of the tongue. How many of you can recall Still to this day, deep words of blessing. You see an image on the screen here of three men, three old looking dudes. Um, on the far right, that's uh, Fred Walker, a, f a football coach at Wheaton College. In the middle is Dizzy Dean, famous pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals. And on the far left is my wife's grandfather, Douglas Johnston, with sweet hair. Uh, that's a picture of him when he was a senior in college. He ended up pitching for the Cardinals briefly and uh, was a remarkable athlete and then went on uh, to become a pastor, left his pitching career to become a minister, was a preacher for 50 plus years. When he was old, near the end of his life, he came to visit and I was a young preacher just getting started out and I was in my first sermons, I can remember. And I was talking to him a few days before to give the sermon. I was nervous about it. And I asked him, I said, well, what does, you know, ask, give me some advice as a man who's given his whole life to studying the word and preaching it faithfully. He said, just preach the word. I said, well, what does that mean? And he gave some explanation that I don't remember. And then he came to hear me preach. I'm so glad there's no recording left that I can find of that sermon because I'm sure it was terrible. And afterwards we had dinner and I remember him, he, he could have told a thousand things that I got wrong or said wrong or did wrong because I know they were there. But he didn't do that. He, he just looked at me and he said, remember when you asked me, Jeff, what it means to preach the word? And I said, uh-huh. He said, it's just what you did. I'm 53 years old. I, those words are still in there, you know? 
And, and quite frankly, at the time of my life, I was wrestling with my calling and my call to this. Is this my, what's what you mean for me, God? Am I supposed to give my life to this? And those words by my wife's grandfather helped shape the trajectory of my life, helped clarify my own calling. Words are powerful. The power of life and death are in them, in the tongue. C.S. Lewis put it this way in his great book, Till We Have Faces. Child, to say the very thing you really mean, the whole of it, nothing more or less or other than what you mean. That's the whole art and joy of words. But that's hard to do. How many of us do that? Say what we mean, what God intends for us to say, and only that. With no hint of pride, no turn of deceit, no nudging the conversation in our direction, just what, we, what God has given us to say. You might think, okay, I get it. So control the tongue. Don't say certain things and say other things. Actually, that's not what James is saying. This brings us to the problem of the tongue. The problem of the tongue. James is saying you actually cannot control the tongue. It's not a matter of just bite your tongue more. Don't say that harsh thing or that critical thing or that deceitful thing or that prideful thing and say kinder things. What was it? Uh, thumper? Said to Bambi, I don't remember this. Remember the movie? Right? Yeah. I think Bambi got canceled. Is that true? That's another conversation. I don't know. Anyway, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Right? It's not just that. It's something deeper going on here. The problem is we cannot control our tongue. Look at what James says in verses 7 through 10. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. You watch these YouTube shows, maybe like I do, and you see people like taming snakes, cobras, holding them up like this, like, what is wrong with people? Why are you doing that, right? Or tigers, which they eventually eat the trainers, in a, anyway. But they, they, we tame wild beasts. And in James' day, in the Roman Colosseum, the same thing was true. But he says, you, but no human being can tame the tongue. G.K. Chesterton called it the untamable two-ounce beast. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and our Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth, Come blessing and cursing, my brothers. These things ought not to be so. Cursing does not mean swearing or like putting a hex on somebody. It means you're in church. All hail King Jesus. All hail the Savior of the world. And you walk out. She is such a, can you believe? They're made in the image of God. They're image bearers, made in the likeness of God. It, you're, it's totally incongruous is his point. This is the problem of the tongue, and we all have it. How often have you had the experience? You're saying something, and almost before the words are out, almost the minute you hit send, you're like, oh, why did I say that? I shouldn't have said that. Anyone? If your hand's not up, you are a lion. Right? <laughs> Every one of us has had that experience. Why did I say that? Or why did I say it that way in this time? I know better than that. I didn't mean that. Over and over and over again. Look at verse, in verse 8, James calls the tongue, he says it's full of deadly poison. And it leaks out, even when we don't want it to. His point is how we speak to others is a kind of barometer for what's really going on in our hearts. Like you, I've said to myself, and you've said this too, I didn't mean that. I was only kidding. I take it back. But the truth is, if we're really honest, part of us did mean it. That's why we said it. That part of us, that ugly part of our hearts, did mean it. We instantly regret it, but there's a part of it, because the point is something's wrong inside that would cause that word to come out. This is, James is really echoing the teaching of his brother, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 12. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person, out of his good treasure, brings forth good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you'll be justified. And by your words you will be condemned. That ought to make you shudder a bit. It does me. How many careless, thoughtless, unkind, selfish, insensitive words have I spoken? 
to my wife, to my children, to some of you, I could not count them. And I will give an account for them. And so will you. Not my word, your own. <laughs> we all will. And that ought to make you tremble. But there's actually a hint of, of good news hidden in this passage. It's in the first couple lines. Make the tree good and the fruit will be good. The reason we speak careless, thoughtless, insensitive, harmful, hurtful words is because we have a heart problem, not just a tongue problem. The reason you can't control your tongue is because you cannot change your own heart. This is what James and Jesus are really getting at here. This brings us to the transformation of the tongue. Notice that Jesus does not say, if your tongue causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Right? He says it about the eye and the hand, remember those sayings? Not about the tongue. Years ago, I, I played a football in college and briefly in the arena league, very briefly, not worth mentioning, but I just mentioned it. Anyway, um, I was still playing in this like full contact league with no pads, with a bunch of uh, guys that were still holding on to their ego. And I was a youth pastor. My wife was like, stop, stop with this. Uh, but anyway, I was trying to tackle this guy, and he kneed me in the chin, and I bit my tongue almost off, almost in half. I had, I had to drive myself to the emergency room. I won't go into gory detail about it, but it was nasty. They stitched up my tongue. My tongues heal fast, but I, I had to like speak at a, re, a retreat like the next week. I'm like, look, 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 look. like I can't, I can't say anything, you know? So my point in that story, and it's gross, is that Jesus doesn't say, cut the tongue off. That's not gonna change the issue because the issue is deeper than that. The issue's in your heart. Look at what he says in verses 11 through 12. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. What's he saying? Well, how many of you have been apple picking this fall or plan to go or ever been in your life, right? When you go to those apple trees, you want the red delicious, the gala, the food, whatever apples you like. Not the yellow ones, blech, those are gross. But um, you want the, the apples you love. You're not expecting to find pears, plums, oranges, wrong tree. The point is, if I struggle with unkind, critical, harsh, hurtful, prideful words, the issue is not here, it's here. There's something wrong at the root, at the source, and that needs to be changed and transformed. The transformation of the tongue comes about by the transformation of the heart. This is what Jesus means in Luke chapter 6. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth, her mouth speaks. It's not merely a matter of managing your tongue better. Don't say that. Your words reveal what's really going on in your heart. I remember reading through the World Harvest Mission on Discipleship years ago. We were using it in a group that I was in. It's kind of a discipleship guide. And they had these like weekly exercises, challenges spiritually to, to take. And one of them was about your speech. I'll never forget it. It said, uh, this for one week, for seven days, take this challenge. Maybe, maybe this week is a good challenge for us. Here's the challenge. Say nothing that in any way promotes yourself. Say no word that has anything to do with, with self-aggrandizement. So turn no conversation toward you. Fish for no compliments. Find, say nothing that has anything to do with promoting yourself. And then the second challenge, part of the challenge is say nothing that in any way demeans another person or criticizes them for a week. That doesn't mean in our life there aren't times when we speak the truth and the truth is about a challenge to something the culture is saying or something that, that is, is untrue. So certainly, but for a week, what if we took that challenge? Say nothing that elevates me and say nothing that diminishes anyone else. You might think, I could do that. It's really hard. I tried it. Maybe it's just me. I was stunned and discouraged a bit by how often the words I'm saying are a little bit one or the other. A little bit putting somebody down, even if it's meant to be funny and sarcastic or puffing myself up. And, and the, the, I think the the benefit of that exercise is not to make you realize how bad you are, but to bring a light to bear on that so that Christ can begin to heal it and to work on you and to change you. It's actually good news if you let him do that. 
say nothing that promotes me, nothing that diminishes someone else, but only that which builds up and points people to Christ. So I'll ask this question as we get ready to wrap it up here. What do your words reveal about you? If somebody were to capture them, the 20,000 words you speak in a day, 15 to 20,000 words you speak in a day, what do they, and lay them all out and chart it, what does it reveal about your heart? What would somebody say? Here are the themes that are most important to him or to her. Back in verse 6, where James uses the image of fire, he says, The tongue is a fire. It's not just a rhetorical flourish, it's a profound theological point and I think psychological point. The tongue is a fire, and fire can be destructive. We all know that. Fire can also be refining, purifying. What happens in Acts chapter 2? Remember the story? The first disciples at Pentecost praying, the Spirit comes upon them, and they begin to speak the glories and wonders and mysteries and good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in other tongues. And tongues of fire appeared above their heads. The tongue can be that which God gives us to proclaim his glory and his goodness and his majesty in the world. What, what if we were a people so transformed by the grace of Jesus, our hearts were so turned inside out by who he is and what he's done that we don't even think about to speak a critical word. It doesn't even occur to us to say a harsh, sharp, self-promoting word. What's pouring out of me is, is, is fueled by, right, the grace of Jesus Christ that has changed me and us. We, we live in a world that's so full of words, cruel words, fake news, deceitful words, harsh words, prideful words. As the people that belong to Jesus, James is saying, we ought to be pouring out words that are his, that are, that are blessing people, that are, you have people in your life that God has put in your life that you can speak his word into and they'll carry that around the rest of their life because you spoke the word of God, the truth about who they are, about who God is into their heart. Yeah, our word is in no, does not, our culture does not need more words. It needs more of his word on our lips spoken into the world. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let's be the kind of people that are overflowing in grace and mercy and love and truth. That's what our world needs, those kind of words. And praise God that in Christ, the book of Hebrews says, in the, long ago God spoke through the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us through his son Jesus. He's the living word spoken into your heart and in mine. He heals our hearts by his grace, and that's what changes your tongue. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pause and acknowledge that we will give an account for every careless, thoughtless, harmful word. And there are many, and we confess it and we repent of it. Many we have spoken, many spoken to us. Our world is full of these words. But you placed us in this world to be different, to speak your word, words of hope and healing and mercy and love. How different would our lives be and the lives of the people around us if we were people of your word, overflowing with grace on our lips. We give you all the praise and thank you, Jesus, the living word. Amen. I love that old hymn, Be Thou My Vision and Thou My True Word. May he be the true word to you. Brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen.